Hey, hey, Marcus House and Mark Thrym with you here and welcome to our collaborative series of the SpaceX ITS Mars colonization mission. If you haven't already viewed earlier parts, check them out here. In part two, we launched the tanker, refueled the ship and then re-landed the booster. The ship, of course, is now completing its Mars transfer burn and ejecting from Earth much, much faster than most launches would be done previously. The main goal is to get passengers to Mars in the lowest time possible. The average transfer time to Mars with the ship will depend on the position of Mars in its orbits. Mars does actually have a slightly elliptical orbit around the Sun, meaning that it does vary quite a bit in its distance from the Sun. In the SpaceX documentation, it is estimated that the average transfer time will be around 115 days, so just a little under four months. A regular bare minimum home and transfer of around 3.6 kilometers per second to Mars would generally take over double this time. So the ship needs to eject from Earth at a much higher velocity than normal to essentially cut the trip in half like this. Again, this is all possible due to the extra delta V the ship can obtain by refueling in orbit. So instead of a 3.6 km per second ejection burn, SpaceX's ship would need to eject at over 5 km per second. With the solar panels deployed after the transfer burn, the ship is specced to obtain 200 kilowatts of power as there is no day-night cycle after leaving Earth's sphere of influence, the solar power will be constantly obtained, so onboard batteries should stay fairly constantly charged throughout the entire journey. Obviously though, the amount of solar energy hitting the panels will decrease depending on the distance from the sun. So if the panels are to receive the full 200 kilowatts of power just after ejecting from Earth's sphere of influence, when closer to Mars the panels would, we imagine, get roughly 50% of this value, and less again of course when landed on Mars itself. Mars of course has a day-night cycle very similar to the Earth, spinning once every 24 hours, 37 minutes and 22 seconds. So similar to Earth, batteries will need to be fully charged through the day and power conserved as much as possible during the night. The SpaceX presentation video mentioned an interplanetary coast speed of just over 100,000 kilometers per hour. This would of course be the velocity of the ship while in its solar orbit, but the more impressive figure here is the Mars entry velocity of 8,500 meters per second. So this is the intercept velocity that the ship will be traveling at when it's actually reaching Mars. From interplanetary space, the ship will enter the atmosphere either capturing into orbit or as mentioned in the SpaceX presentational documentation, proceeding directly to landing. Now, we have tried this a number of times and we suspect it is more likely that the ship will probably aero break in two passes. The first aero break to get into a Mars orbit and then the second to aero break and land. We say this simply because of the very fast Earth to Mars transfer. It seems a little unlikely that the aero break could be done in one pass, but then again, there is a lot of surface area on the ship to help slow it down, so who knows? It has been stated that by using the ship's aerodynamic lift capability and advanced heat shield underside, the ship would be able to decelerate from entry velocities in excess of 8.5 kilometers per second at Mars with an approximate 4 to 6 g's of deceleration. The escape velocity of Mars is around 5 kilometers per second, so at a bare minimum around 3.5 kilometers per second of the ship's velocity will need to be wiped off in order to get captured. The benefit of first getting into a Mars orbit is that then there is more time to analyze and plan the final aero braking maneuver and more accurately predict landing locations. The heat shielding itself is proposed to be the same material as used on the existing Dragon spacecraft or at least an evolution of the Pika material. SpaceX claim it to be the most advanced heat shield ever flown and can potentially be used hundreds of times with only minor degradation each flight. For anyone interested in the Pika material, there is a link to a related video in the description. 
The long-term goal is to load the ship with 100 passengers at a time, but this will almost certainly not be the initial crew number. In fact, the first crew may only have enough human capability to start setting up the basics and begin testing life on Mars, perhaps only 10 or so. This will obviously be an extremely precarious mission, and like any dangerous exploration mission, the chances of death are going to be high. That being said though, just imagine being the first life form in the history of the Earth to step onto another planet. I mean, there can't be a much better way to go, can there? On this first mission, there would be no way to refuel and return to Earth in the short term, and one of the primary critical tasks for the first humans would be to set up an initial small propellant plant to begin refueling the ship for a future mission. This would then be expanded over time, but it would utilize the easily obtainable carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water ice from the surface of Mars to generate liquid methane and liquid oxygen to refuel the ship. The ship of course could then be sent back to Earth to refuel with new crew and cargo to return in the very next available transfer window to Mars. So we hope you enjoyed part 3 of our Mars colonization mission. Part 4 is coming soon and will be linked to this video. Thanks to all our wonderful subscribers for following our channels. And if you haven't subscribed and have enjoyed this content, please do subscribe to see more. And we'll see you in part 4.